man in the apartment. I had my son when I was in high school. After he was born, I moved in with my then boyfriend and now husband and his mom and brother. They lived in this old rundown apartment on the north side of our tiny town. The layout had our room with the bathroom immediately to the right, and we could see my brother-in-law's room parallel to ours down a short hallway. My son stayed in our room, which was having a full-size bed in it. I was still in school, so it was easier for him to sleep with us. That way I wouldn't have to get up for feedings and could still make it to school the next day. It was a tight fit. My brother-in-law spent a lot of time away, so when he was gone we crashed in his room because he had a king-sized bed. But every time we would go down the hall toward his room, my son would scream. He would keep me up most of the night, waking more than usual when I tried to sleep in there. I assumed it was the change in room, but we also had a cat that roamed the entire house, except he wouldn't go down that hall. I finally just stopped trying and stayed in our tiny bed. My son also didn't like to be in the bathroom, even for his baths. Now my husband and his mom worked in a town an hour's drive away. They would leave at 4 a.m. to get to work on time. One morning something wakes me up. I look at the doorway of our room at the hall toward my boyfriend's room, or excuse me, brother-in-law's room. They're not home and to see somebody standing in the hall. I think it must be my husband. Then I look at the clock and see it's five. So my son and I are the only ones home. I sit up and he turns toward me. Half of his face looks like it had been burned. He turns away and walks toward the bathroom and dissipates. I shrugged, laid down, went back to sleep. This wasn't my first rodeo with weird ghost stuff. See Haunted Elevator Ride. I needed to sleep for school. We stayed there for a year while I finished high school. Husband graduated the year before. And then we went to college and never saw the man again. But son hated the hall. The back room too. Even the bathroom. Even when we came back to visit over the next few years. And in case you're wondering, we'll be married 22 years this year, and my son is 23 now. But there were other times over the years that I knew he was seeing or talking to someone I couldn't see. We both even have an identical reoccurring dream about us having an accident that's never happened, yet. He even got his own ghost encounter when he went off to college. My husband and our daughter, 17, never have weird stuff happen to them. Haunted Elevator Ride The summer I turned 14, I spent a lot of time hanging out at my cousin's. She's a 27-year-old female. I was helping her take care of her kids. One evening, we had to take her daughter to the ER. So, cousin, some relative from her mother's side, will call friend. But I didn't really know well, 15-year-old female, and I took her. The hospital had a basement, a ground floor, and then three on the back side where the ER was. You went on the ground in the back, but the first in the front of the building because it was on a slope. So because it was after hours, we entered in the back, which I had never done before. Now I have no sense of direction when I'm in a building, especially a hospital, even to this day, let alone going in a different way than I'm familiar with. While waiting, friend and I decide to find vending machine, which was on another floor. I can't remember which. We took the elevator but couldn't find the machine. Nobody was around and we didn't want to get lost, so we got back on the elevator. We got confused of what floor we were on and ended up going to every floor but the basement. I knew the morgue was there. But nothing looked right. We ended up on the third floor. But when I stepped out, the hall was dark, and I knew I was definitely in the wrong place. Jumped back in the elevator, decided to go to the ground floor. Must have been it after all, even though it didn't look right. When I went back into the elevator and hit the button, 
The door closes. Then suddenly it opens again, but nobody's there. But then it shuts and temp drops. I look at my friend who's standing in the well in front of the controls. There's this blurry shape between us about chest height. The friend is frozen in place, not saying a word. Elevator gets to the ground and I jump out. The friend is still standing there. I reach in and pull her out and she snaps too. I ask what that was. She says what? I stay in the elevator and she has no idea what I'm talking about. So I don't say a word about it to anybody because, well, I don't want them to think I've gone crazy. Fast forward a few weeks. I'm at lunch with cousin and her mom. We're talking about the hospital visit, but I keep the elevator ride to myself. Her mom starts talking about how she used to work the night shift at the front desk way back in the day. She says a little boy who was, well, dead, used to ride the elevator down from the third floor. It would stand at the end of the hall, stare at her for a bit. She'd say hi and you'd eventually get back in the elevator and go back to the third floor. She goes on to tell a little history of how the third floor was in the TB ward way back when that was rampant. People would leave their family members there until they passed, and then they were cremated on sight. She believed he was one of the kids who had been left there. It was then that I went ahead and told her what had happened to me and my friend. She was convinced it was the same boy. The hospital was later shut down and another was built, but before it was. I did a job shadow the next year in high school with a social worker at the hospital. While with them, we took the stairs. He said he never took the elevators. The doctors would tell you because the stairs are healthier, but that's not the real reason. I was very much thankful to take the stairs, but I asked him the reason, but he wouldn't say. Went back one other time to visit a friend took the stairs then, too. Nebraska This took place in the early 1970s in Nebraska. It was in a little bitty town called Dorchester, not too far outside of Lincoln. My mom, abandoned by her first husband, did her best to raise my two older brothers. My brothers were ages four and seven. Times were lean and hard for the little family. They had some help from my grandparents. Mom moved into a shabby old house located in town. The house had some history. It belonged to the railroad, serving as a boarding house for employees and passengers dating back to the 1880s. It fulfilled that role until it fell into disuse. It was eventually made into a rental property. Mom noticed strange happenings surrounding the family. Starting the day they moved in, small rows of salt neatly poured on all the window sills and across all doorways. The family's pet St. Bernard named Barney refused to enter the house. He stayed outside regardless of the weather or the time of the year. To make matters worse, both my brothers uncharacteristically started wetting their beds. One morning, my brother, age four, played in the living room, yet he watched a specific section of the wall. Mom noticed he sometimes talked to a particular part of the wall. Mom was cleaning house at the time. She had one eye on him and the other on washing dishes. Figuring he was using his imagination, shrugging off his behavior. She soon started vacuuming the living room. My brother sat watching Sesame Street on the television. As she swept, she noticed my brother stand up and walk over to the wall that he had talked to earlier. He then put both hands on the wall, slowly moving them up and down. He continued talking to the area and then broke into tears. Mom shut off the vacuum and asked what we you know, ask him what was wrong. She said my brother turned and faced her. His face flushed and wet. Through his tears, he sobbed. 
Mommy, there's a sad man in the wall and he's crying and he wants out. He's there, Mommy. See him. Can you see him? Help him. Mommy, please help him. Mom quickly snatched up one brother and half dragged the other. She ran the three blocks, terrified, to my grandparents' house. My grandparents finally talked Mom into returning to the home a few days later. A feat that took much convincing, threatening, and reassuring. In the months after that event, a loud, crashing bang sound often emitted from the attic. Mom described the sound as an adult taking a bowling ball and slamming it on the ground as hard as possible. A rolling sound soon followed the loud impact. Every time the sound occurred, it was investigated. Nothing was ever found. This happened both day and night. My grandparents both experienced this on many occasions. When the sound would happen, my grandparents said both my brothers would scream and go into hysterics. Mom felt terrified and trapped. She was bound into a lease, borrowed heavily from my grandparents to make ends meet. She had nowhere to go with two small children, couldn't afford to leave. Months later, my dad came into the picture. He eventually moved into the house. It was a damn creepy house. He said this on many occasions. He hated living there the minute he moved in. Dad had returned from Vietnam a few years prior. He was a combat veteran. Whenever he was in that house, the feeling of being watched with ill intent plagued him. Many nights for him were filled with terrible nightmares about the war. He had never experienced this before moving into the home. Mom said she would often wake up to find him pacing restlessly in the darkness. Other nights she was awoken by the muffled screams of his tormented sleep. One Sunday evening, the family returned home from grocery shopping. Upon unlocking the front door and entering the home, they found four dead black birds in the center of the living room. The birds lined up in a parallel row with their wings spread as if in flight. They each lay on their breasts. Heads and beaks were pointing toward a specific area of the living room. Instantly, the atmosphere was pierced by my brother's sharp, shrill, screaming cries. My father stood in the entryway. His arms were full of groceries. His mouth gaped open in utter shock by the insanity before him. My mom immediately turned and crouched to console the boys and shield them from the scene. It happened as she kissed and embraced her boys. A loud bashing sound hammered from the attic above. The windows of the house vibrated from the concussion. Dust slowly drifted down through the last rays of sunlight. Mom said the utter silence that followed was incredibly unnerving. Then the slow, heavy rolling sound again filled the entire house. My dad set down the bags of groceries, made his way to the attic, cautiously approaching. Mom continued to hug my brothers. She happened to look past their shoulders onto the large front porch. She saw Barney there. The giant St. Bernard lay cowered with his tail tightly pulled under him. The dog was unwilling to make eye contact when she called out to him. Instead, the animal shook uncontrollably. She noticed a large wet spot beneath him. Dad came down from the attic a few minutes later. Nothing was ever found, as usual. This was the breaking point for my family. My dad decided to sell his vehicle and worked overtime when possible. He paid off the lease at the first opportunity. He moved them all out of the house, never looked back. My dad said that once they left that house, they never had any other experiences like it. His terrible nightmares stopped. I traveled to Nebraska with my dad in 2002. He showed me the old house, which was abandoned but still standing. Dad grimly joked, saying as we drove by, wonder if that crying man ever made it out of the wall. Alfred's Gift 
It was the winter of 2000. I was in my hometown of Anchorage. On this evening, I was relaxing on the couch, planning on watching another rerun of Seinfeld before turning in for the night. It's worth mentioning that my girlfriend at the time happened to be an Alaskan native. She had recently put the kids to bed and was taking a shower. My girlfriend's sister was visiting our home. She was staying in the downstairs spare bedroom. She was in town due to having some medical checkups scheduled for the following week at the ANMC. We'd lived in a subdivision off Arctic Boulevard that bordered Chester Creek. This area is called Midtown. It's not too far from downtown Anchorage. I suppose the time was around 10 or 11 p.m. The moon was large and full that January night. I remember looking out the front room window seeing the rooftops of the neighboring houses sharply silhouetted in the glow. My dog lazily snoozed on the floor next to the couch. Eventually my eyes also started to get heavy. This was due to the background noise of the television. It was sort of mixing with the quiet white noise of the shower. It had a calming effect. The baseboard heater quietly clicked and popped, wrapping me in a relaxing warmth. I soon dozed off. Suddenly I was awoken by a sharp, jolting burst of sound. My eyes immediately snapped open in shock. This tone ripped through the tranquility of the peaceful night with gravelly croaking. There was no mistaking that sound, especially during the winter months in Alaska. This was the sound of the raven. I was thinking, why the hell is a raven making a racket at this time of night? Barely had time to finish that thought when I heard the bedroom door fly open and then the sound of hurrying footsteps. I look up in time to see my girlfriend, quickly putting on a robe as she runs to each kid's bedroom, anxiously checking on them. I sat up on the couch, still dazed from my interrupted sleep, trying to get my head around what exactly I was seeing and hearing and while the commotion. I glanced over to the TV and I saw static across the screen. The time on the DVD player displayed 3 a.m. in a green light. The dog was up and alert. Hackle stood tall down its back. Suddenly, the sister quickly comes up the stairs. She had a genuine look of wide-eyed concern and alarm deeply etched onto her face. Once my girlfriend made sure the kids were safe and asleep, she wordly looked out each window. For what, I had no idea, until she stopped dead in her tracks at the window in front of me. What's wrong? What's wrong? The sister kept fearfully whispering to herself, slowly wringing her nightshirt in her hands, timidly shuffling across the floor toward the living room window next to her sister couldn't understand why both sisters and the dog were having such an intense reaction. The scene was surreal. I found myself in a confused daze as I sort of stood up and approached the window myself. There was the culprit, perched on a handrail on her deck. I've always known ravens to be large birds, yet this bird seemed utterly massive this close. The bird was so black that its feathers took on a deep purplish hue in the moonlight glow. Its large, round, inky black eyes assessed each of us individually, it intelligently eyeing us up and down as it sharply cut its head from side to side. It yet seemed to take greater interest in the sisters. This bird carried an intense, still, and heavy presence. It showed absolutely no fear of the humans that stood before it. It methodically stretched out its neck and opened its beak wide. A few seconds of silence passed until it made a sound I've never heard from a raven before or after this bizarre night. The mournful cry it made reminded me of the wail of a small infant. The raven slowly weaved its head in a low figure-eight pattern as it made this continuous cry. The moment that sound filled the night air, a cold chill pricked down my neck across my back. I was filled with a sense of loneliness I've never felt before. 
I quickly glanced over at the sisters. They were tightly clinging to each other, knuckles white with teary eyes, keenly locked on the bird's bizarre display. I immediately thought that I was witnessing something I was not meant to see. It was very much an interloper in a personal exchange. Once the bird finished this almost ritual-like behavior, it quietly eyed both the women for a few more moments before leaping off into the night. An item lay where the bird once perched on the railing. Curiosity getting the best of me, mixed with the desperate need to escape the strange and awkward atmosphere that overcame the room, I heaved open the half-frozen sliding door to enter the deck to retrieve the item, the weather outside being bitterly cold. I instantly regretted my decision as my body went into an immediate shiver. The skin on my face was tightening while my ears and nose burned painfully. The snow squeaked loudly beneath my bare feet as I gingerly approached the item. The mystery gift left behind soon became clear. A small bundle of needles from a spruce tree lay on the barren rail. Clearly the women were both shaken to their core that night. Quiet melancholy soon followed and lingered heavily on the sisters. Continuing through the following days after the bird's departure, the reason why was unknown to each of us, yet I had a strong gut feeling that it was not my place to talk about what we each saw. A few days passed. Once I got off work, the three of us decided to take the dog for a walk on the community trail not far from our subdivision. Heavy cloud cover filled the sky over Anchorage that evening. Large snowflakes slowly fell. The walk was mainly dark, except for the occasional light pole that sparsely dotted the trail, washing the path in a sort of fluorescent glow. The sounds of 6 p.m. city traffic droned in the background. We talked amongst ourselves and we heard a man's low, weak cry for help in the darkness ahead. He immediately stopped and listed. Listened, I believe they meant, not listed. The dog's ears snapped forward, head pointing slightly off the trail. A long, whimper-like growl emitted from the animal's core, followed by a concerned huff. Once more we heard a weak, agonized voice call out, pleading for God's intervention. The cry drifted through the snow-laden spruce trees that lined the trail. I glanced down and noticed a footpath in the snow leading through the woodland in the direction of the cries. I hand the dog's leash to the sisters. I tell them to stay put. Both women sharply plead for me not to go as I continue into the murk to investigate. As I weave my way through the tiny trail, my feet bust through the upper crust of snow. I sink to thigh depth. I continue to slog my way forward. Before long, I came to a clearing in the trail. In the darkness, I can make out the silhouette of a lone tent. I call out as I approach the tent, only to be met with silence. When I'm closer, I notice a battered tarp draped over the tent shell haphazardly. An inch of snow lay on the tarp, and the cheap tent bows under the weight. The unzipped tent entrance gave the appearance of a gaping black mouth in the gloom. I strained to look inside and call out a sharp hello. Not a sound or any movement came from the tent. My concentration was suddenly broken. Irritated and worried calls from the sisters rang out demanding for me to come back. Before making my way back to the main trail, I investigated the campsite. Piles of trash littered the area in dark mounds. I made out some of what appeared to be scattered empty food containers. White trash bags ripped open full of melissane or miscellaneous used clothes. Broken children's toys lay beside empty beer and alcohol containers. Piles of empty aerosols labeled canned air peeked through the snow. Frozen clothing remained hanging from the hacked-up trees that surrounded the site. A deep, low sobbing drifted from behind me down the trail where I came. The woman again loudly shouted for my return with urgency. As quickly as possible I made my way back to the sisters. 
They both pointed to the direction from where the cry came from. The focus was down the wide main trail that eventually opened to an empty city park named the Valley of the Moon. We called out as we cautiously searched the entire park. The only response was the muffled noise of a city in the winter. We made our way to a metal-roofed pavilion. Underneath the structure sat a few graffitied, weather-beaten wooden picnic tables. This area was the only spot on the park not covered in snow. We decided at this point that it would be best to call APD and inform them of everything. We did precisely that. APD arrived, performed a search, and found nothing. Being late, we now started for home. We were making our way through the playground, passing a tall, rocket-shaped jungle gym. That's when the sister gave a sharp, loud gasp. We glanced over to see, and she looked upwards. The city lights reflected a deep red hue on the heavy snow-laden clouds, revealing a dark black silhouette of a raven who sat silently perched. We all felt the familiar heaviness of its gaze. My stomach tightened as we continued forward, lowering our faces from the pelting snow while picking up our pace to walk home. Two days later, the morning came for the sister to leave. We were getting ready to drop her off at the airport. That's when my home phone rang. My girlfriend answered the phone. I was loading the sister's bag into the truck when I heard loud shouting and screaming coming from the house. I soon found both women crying hysterically for the nephew. Alfred was a quiet boy who grew into an even quieter young man. He was raised in a village in southeast Alaska by his grandparents and aunties. Alfred became heavily addicted to alcohol, so much so his family sent him to Anchorage in hopes of treatment. Unfortunately, the treatment never took hold after many attempts. Eventually, he found himself homeless on the streets of Anchorage. He was ashamed of the situation, refused to return home, ignoring his family's pleas to return. He steadily continued to sink deeper into his addiction. Alfred became a living ghost in the urban landscape. He survived living hand-to-mouth by panhandling and stealing being afraid to sleep at the local homeless shelters at night. Alfred preferred to sleep where he could. One cold night he closed his eyes and never opened them again. The Spinard Community Patrol found his frozen body early the following day. The police report stated Alfred's body was found in a fetal position. The man was lying on top of a picnic table underneath the pavilion at the Valley of the Moon Park. When found, it was also mentioned that his body was covered in spruce boughs in a desperate attempt to stay warm. Bows. The night Alfred died was the very night we received our visit and gift from the mysterious raven. Unbeknownst to us, three days after Alfred's death, we heard the sad cries for help in the park, the same park where he died. I'd often wondered looking back if the raven kept silent watch over him. Maybe Alfred was able to catch a glimpse of its dark silhouette in the yellow moonlight, high up on its perch. Perhaps he also felt the heavy gaze upon him during his final moments. We'll never know. I like to tell myself the bird was there and Alfred found comfort in the gaze, knowing he wasn't alone. He would have a companion during his final walk through the dark wilderness in his eternal journey home. The sisters and their family never once referred to this mysterious bird as Raven. They called it by its original ancient name. The name given to it by their people in myths and legends and centuries ago. The sacred name of the Yale. Photographs This story took place in 1989 or 1990. My family recently moved to southern Indiana. We settled in a small town a few miles outside of Corydon called Central. For those of you that don't know, this area is out in the country. It was my freshman year in a new high school. 
Yet I eventually met a couple of buddies who lived somewhat close to me. One morning in class, one of my friends mentioned this old farmer who lived not too far from his place outside of a little town called Mockport. This older farmer passed away some months back. There did not seem to be anybody around his property. An urban and country legend was that this old farmer had his own catfish pond on his property that he stocked. The fish in this little pond were reportedly huge due to him not letting anybody fish in his property, except him. That was all we needed to hear. Each of us loved fishing. We made plans to stay at my friend's place that weekend and go after these fish. The weekend arrived and the three of us found ourselves at the crack of dawn standing in front of an old shabby looking farmhouse situated in the middle of an overgrown field. <clears throat> It was by no means a working farm. The house didn't appear vacant. There were no vehicles around. Behind the house was the legendary pond. We immediately set to work trying to catch these gigantic fish. The entire time we fished, the dark old house seemed to loom in the background. We quietly spoke amongst ourselves, wondering what happened to the old farmer. My friend said all he knew was one evening he saw an ambulance out in front of the house with its strobe lights flashing. A few days later, his grandmother told him the old fella had passed away that same night in the home. He was very elderly and lived by himself due to being a widower. As the hours passed without even a nibble, it became clear the only thing biting were the bugs that swarmed us. By that time, the sun was beating down on us, making us sweaty and quite miserable. Soon boredom overtook us. So we decided to give up on our dreams of catching monster catfish. We packed our stuff and started to head back to my friend's house. I was walking toward the road giving my friend hell, good-naturedly, about his fanciful tale of trophy catfish and mysterious geriatric farmers. That's when our other friend shouted out, Hey guys! The front door of this place is open. Let's check it out. We both looked back at him and then dumbly looked at each other. Being the young idiots we indeed were, we nervously agreed to drop our fishing poles and decided to explore cautiously. What struck me as odd immediately upon entering the home was that it was still fully furnished and looked lived in. The decor was dated to the 50s through the 70s era. Dusty and very cluttered power was shut off to the house. The only light that we had was whatever daylight made it through the filthy curtains inside the house. It was suffocatingly hot and stuffy. The house was filled with a stank of garbage, rot, mold, nicotine. We could hear a scurrying sound. We assumed it was either roaches or mice. We found overflowing trash cans and rotten food in the kitchen, sitting on the messy countertops dirty dishes piled high in the overfull sink. There was a constant buzz that droned inside the house. This was due to the many flies trapped between the curtains and the windows. The atmosphere was very heavy and depressing, so much so that I felt a bit sick to my stomach. Once we made it our way into the living room, we were met by a peculiar sight. The telephone was a typical old-style rotary phone mounted on the wall. It had an extremely long cord. No, that's not part of the story. Jeez. The receiver lay in the floor stretched out to the middle of the room and it was dead. Next to the phone's receiver, medical debris lay haphazardly scattered across the pea green shag carpet. Ripped open rectangle-shaped wrappers of various sizes. Dirty gauze pads, small hard plastic orange caps stood out in the gloom due to being the cleanest items in the house. A dirty, torn old button-up shirt also lay in a heap next to the wadded-up blue latex gloves. We walked around the lower rooms. They were all pretty much the same. Dust, extreme clutter, memories, and pictures of someone's life. The house had two levels. 
We made our way up the old narrow wooden steps that creaked incredibly loud during our ascent. The temperature upstairs was almost unbearably hot. All of us were drenched in sweat. The already rank smell of the house was now made more pungent by her body odor. Being there were no windows in the stairwell, we were in complete darkness, fumbling and feeling our way through the stairs. We could barely see a dull glow of light shining through the closed curtains on the upper level ahead. We made our way to the top of the steps and noticed three rooms. We made our way into one of the rooms. The lighting was very dim. While slowly making my way towards the curtain to let some light in, I stepped on unknown items on the floor. They loudly crunched under my feet. I pulled open the curtains. The light immediately blinded us. As our eyes adjusted, we saw we were in a bedroom, a room that looked like it had not been slept in for many years. Dirty clothing was strung across the bed and across the floors in piles. The lone mattress was water-stained and full of holes. It was also at a sagging ceiling. The floor was full of mice droppings, plaster, and the exoskeletons of hundreds of insects. I vividly recall a single-framed black-and-white photo sitting on an old dusty nightstand of a young couple in an embrace. The man was in a military uniform with his hat jauntily placed on his head in a stoic expression. The woman had a feathery hat in her head, and her own smile was bright, holding a puppy between them. My buddy made his way to the next room. It was a small room and had a large closet that seemed to be used as storage. The walls had shelving that held many jars of various pickled fruits and vegetables all covered in grime. The floor was packed with canning equipment, jars, pots and containers and tarnished utensils. We turned our attention to the last room and noticed the door to this room was closed. We opened the door and saw blackness. Our eyes were now adjusted to the light. We could only see a few feet into the room. I once again carefully made my way to the window and opened the curtains. When the light came in, we were surprised at what we saw. This room, yet dusty, was immaculate and organized. In the corner was a small bed neatly made with stuffed animals. A wooden toy box sat at the foot of the bed full of old children's toys. Tiny shoes and boots lined the wall next to the door. Under the window, a small wooden desk for a child and a swivel chair were on the wall. The name Lauren Cran was written on the desk in a child's handwriting. On the chest of drawers, there was a picture of a little boy in a lone ranger outfit standing next to a pony. I was suddenly overcome with the feeling that we really needed to leave now. I turned to say the same to my friends, when a tremendously loud crack blasted through the silence. What was that? So much so that I thought it was a gunshot. Weird. <laughs> we all literally jumped in fright. Both my friends immediately pointed to the wooden chair with looks of shock and fear on their faces. The time during this moment was an ultra slow motion. I remember my heart pounding in my chest so hard I felt the pressure throb in my ears. I glanced back just in time to see a small swivel chair quickly rotate with so much force that it sent the desk crashing into the wall. We froze and stared at each other with our mouths open in stupid disbelief. Suddenly, my friend bolted for the door. This move triggered a full-on flight response in my remaining two friends. The only thought I had in my mind at that second was that I would not be the last one in line. I would run up and over my friends if they got in the way. In fact, I'm pretty sure I rode one of them halfway down the stairs as he tripped in a sort of panic sprint for the front door. The funny thing afterwards in the days that followed, as we tried to convince each other we didn't see what we did... Instead, we accused each other of pulling off a trick, making the chair do that. It then morphed into teenage male bravado, making fun of the other's masculinity during our frantic dash for the door. Deep down, we knew that there was no trick, 
There's no faking the fear we saw in each other's eyes that day. That happened. To this day, I still can't explain how. I moved again about a year later, eventually lost contact with my two friends. Such is a life. Yet before moving away, I learned that nobody claimed the estate once the old farmer passed away. From what I understand, the state took it over. The company eventually came out and sell and auctioned off the, valuable, uh, the valuables and disposed of the rest. I'm not aware of what became of the property of the house. I know the state became owners of the three fishing poles and tackle box that day. We left them behind in our haste and had no intentions of going back to get them. And I just gotta say, those two weird gunshot sounds while I was reading and before I even got to that part of the story, actually happened. I don't know what it was, but it came through my speaker, I think. Why, when I read the stories, do weird things happen? <laughs> Not even joking. Talking about the paranormal attracts things to me. I've always been fascinated by the paranormal. Demons, religions, ghosts, spirits, angels, etc. My life has been a roller coaster on this front, but I firmly believe in the super and paranatural, and I have for the past seven years now. But that roller coaster is a very, very long ride, and I'm really, really tired right now, so I'm not going to talk or post about that just yet. But I can't go to sleep without typing this small post out, or else I won't get any sleep at all. Because something's already in my room. Like the title says, investigating the paranormal draws things to me. But even thinking about the paranormal or casually talking about it, inquiring about my experiences, all of this draws unknown entities into very close proximity to me. Outside, inside, out with friends, in public and private, doesn't matter where I ask or think. They always arrive when I start and slowly leave when I stop. Demons, ghosts, spirits, I don't know. And frankly, I'm not strong enough to try and find out. But I can sense them. Invisible things that stare and watch and step closer, but never touch or make sound. You know that feeling you get when someone's watching you from behind? Imagine that, but ten times or so. They're harmless, luckily. The light might flicker once in a blue moon, or they might get up right next to my face, but nothing terrible ever occurs. Admittedly, this post is a little bit of a rant, but I do seek some reassurance here, and I should share my personal and past experiences with you all regarding these things that I tracked. I hope to wake up and see a comment or two, saying that perhaps they had the same experience I do. That would give me some small comfort. If you have any experiences or know of this one in particular, please do comment or message me. I'll try to answer them all when I wake up tomorrow. They came back to visit me one last time. A few years ago, I was going through a really rough patch and an unexpected job loss. One random day as I'm walking out of the grocery store with my then 10-year-old daughter, I get this sudden urge to look to my left. I'm startled because I can see my grandma who passed over 20 years ago staring back at me. She had on a long white lace dress. Her hair was curled and she looked to be about mid-40s. I kept my gaze for like 10 seconds as she slowly walked away and I screamed. My God, I can't believe that's her. My daughter, who had only seen pictures of her, exclaimed, Yeah, that was your grandma. I get chills to this day thinking about it. I thought back to what she was wearing and it looked to be a dress not from modern times, similar to what she wore at my parents' wedding in the 80s. Another story is more recent. On this past Mother's Day, I went to visit my biological dad's mom at her gravesite. As I'm talking aloud to her, I smell this waft of perfume around me. 
I look around the cemetery because I'm sure someone must have walked by. No one else was around. She loved perfume, so I immediately knew it was her. A few weeks go by and I get a visitation from this grandma. And in my dream, I was walking into a church and several other people walk past me before she walks toward me. When I saw her, she looked so beautiful like she was literally glowing. She had on a long dress with flowers on it. Her hair was down and curly. I can recall every single detail of what she was wearing down to the shoes. She looked to be in her early thirties. She had a big smile. I hugged her and told her I missed her. She said I love you and miss you too. I noticed she was walking without her cane too. She hugged me so tight and in that moment I felt so peaceful, like a feeling of divine love, serenity and bliss. She then whispered in my ear, Peace be still. That was the end of the dream. I woke up crying and shaking because I was shocked that she had actually showed herself to me. When she died, I pleaded for her to come and visit me and send me signs. I think she gave me that message because I had been going through anxiety and depression. Now whenever I feel down, I think of the two guardian angels I have watching over me. Not sure what's going on in my apartment. I just got home from work, walked in and noticed the curtain rod in my bedroom on the floor. This is a pretty sturdy rod with two pieces of steel that's been there for years. I look around the apartment just to be sure. Well, that I'm the only one there. I texted my husband asked if he had fallen down before he had left the house. Or it. He said no. I go to the bathroom to comb my hair and all of a sudden I hear a plastic on my shower curtain rustle. It's like somebody was in the shower. I have a cloth curtain and a clear vinyl liner behind it. I literally heard the magnet on the liner clank against the tub. I peek behind the curtain, but nothing was there. I don't have any pets. A few years ago, I come home from dropping my daughter off at school. It's about 8 a.m. in the morning. As soon as I walk in, the light in the hallway next to the same bathroom turns on and then off began by itself. I noped it out of there. Back when I used to work from home, I would hear dishes in the sink clanking around or knocking on the fridge. I heard the blinds rustling next to me. I was lying in bed awake one night and I see this blue ball of light flash before me. It darted where the same hallway is. I got up to investigate and the circuit breaker door flung open. It was the latch type of door, requires some force to pull back and secure it closed. The last thing that I can recall happening was when I was in the living room reading something on my phone. My daughter's iPad suddenly started on its own. It said, Mama, I didn't get that. I didn't press anything to alert Siri, and it was really weird that it said Mama. I inquired at the leasing office several times if anybody had passed in here, but they said they didn't have any information. My dead uncle communicated to me through an app. This past Saturday on January 5th, my great uncle passed away unexpectedly in his home. We will call him Uncle Will. Myself and about 20 members of my family met up at Uncle Will's high-rise apartment. It wasn't far from where I lived. We stood outside his apartment door while the police and people from the morgue cleaned the scene and prepared to remove his body. Immediately after they leave, half of us enter the apartment. My relatives start the process of removing contents from the fridge, disposing of cigarette butts and empty bottles. I'm just aimlessly walking around the apartment, which is a one bed, one bath. That's when suddenly I get this urge to, to download this. I get the urge to stutter. I get the urge to download a ghost radar app. I've always been into paranormal and was anxious to see if my uncle's spirit would come through it. I didn't think anything of it when it opened the app because the first two words that populated were children and community. 
but as I walked into his bedroom, the app flashes enter. And as I'm turning toward the bathroom, it said, almost. Then all of a sudden, I get this feeling to want to search the linen closet. I see normal bath products in there. And there's a box that appears out of, sort of out of place. It looks like it has important documents in it. I look down, and there's a money order. The app then says, exact. I'm holding the money order in my hand. And in walks my aunt, who shouts, Oh my God, see found the money order. She looks at me and says, How did you know where it was? I told her I had this gut feeling and the app sort of led me to it. I had no idea that they were looking for it. Turns out the money order for his last rent payment. Would like to think that it was Uncle Will communicating with me through the app one last time. Two days later, his younger brother's Uncle Jay, who had been battling cancer for less than a year, passed away. I also learned that after Uncle Will visited my Uncle Jay in the hospital, just a week before his passing, he was crying profusely and saying he would rather leave than watch his younger brother die. This has been a very difficult time for my family, still in disbelief that we lost two loved ones in such a short amount of time. My condolences. Working nights in an old prison. So I work in a prison in the UK. I always like to work nights because you do seven days on and seven days off. Whilst on nights, I get locked onto a wing with no keys. We have a sealed pouch with a cell key inside for emergencies. If someone is hanging and I need to get in there and cut them down. I'm in charge of looking after 200 plus prisoners. After a busy few hours, the landing's answering call bell, doing my checks on people who are essentially on suicide watch. The wing starts to settle down, and through the night I do multiple patrols. During these patrols, I've witnessed so many bizarre things. Here are just a small portion of the things that have happened to me while on nights. 1. One night on one of the threes landing... I was doing my checks. I heard a loud bang coming from the ones landing outside the servery. When I went to the investigate, when I went to investigate, there was a broom on the floor. When I reviewed the CCTV footage, you can clearly see the broom slowly being lifted away from the wall it was resting on, then quickly getting thrown to the ground. We have the footage burned off. Most of the people at work have seen it. We usually show it to new staff before they do their first night shift to freak them out. 2. One night we had someone overdose. He was located in cell 237. I was working the week after all this happened. The cell was locked off for police investigation. It was completely empty. At about 3.30 a.m. in the morning, the cell bell for 237 was pressed. At first, I didn't even know that this cell belonged to the guy that had died the previous week. But as soon as I looked into the empty cell, I realized and just froze. It takes a lot to freak me out, but I didn't walk back to that part of the landing until roll count. 3. These are some of the more minor but still equally as creepy things that happened. It was just this last week that prompted me to share this. While walking to the three's landing, one of the showers on the two's turned on by itself. The only way to turn it on is to press a button on the wall inside the shower. I went to investigate and the showers were locked and the lights inside turned off. This was about 2.30 a.m. Approximately 30 minutes later, I was walking down the two's landing and an office door slammed shut. I checked the landings for open windows. They were all shut. Again... Every time I hear a noise, I always investigate and love anything creepy, but this scent shivers down my spine. I've got so many more bizarre things that have happened to me. I've heard some really creepy stories from colleagues, too. I could share them in the future. Also, I apologize for grammar mistakes. No worries. I didn't expect this to blow up as much as it has.
scratching at my door. I live in the UK. I was about 17 at the time. I was laying in bed on my phone with my lights off. I heard claws coming up my wooden stairs to the side of the house. This was normal as I had a basset hound who usually likes to kind of coke upstairs to my room. Coke? My house has six bedrooms and a farm that was converted into two houses. My brother and his girlfriend had just moved out. So I had that whole side of the house to myself, which consisted of three bedrooms, a bathroom, the living room, and of course, the attic. I then heard the claws outside of my door stop. I remember seeing the claws of my dog's paws from under the wooden door. They were black like eagle claws, which bent like talons. If you look at a basset hound, they're all the same. So I shouted for him, but he didn't move. My heart dropped when I heard the scratches at my door. They started slowly. It scared me as he's never done that before. I stopped using my phone as a torch and put my side table light on. I could still see the claws, but the scratching had stopped. I then told him to go back downstairs, turn the light off. At this point, I was a bit nervous, but didn't think too much into it. Then it started again. But this time it was faster, as if not only wanting to come in, but was distressed. I turned the light on again this time, not seeing the claws. I felt sick and didn't know what to do. The build of my house, if I screamed, you wouldn't hear it from the other side of the house. I somehow found the courage to open the door to be met with nothing but an empty, dark doorway. I locked my door and climbed back into bed until it started again. I whimpered this time to fuck off downstairs as I had college in the morning. Still nothing when I spoke. Turned the light off again and went underneath my covers. The scratching got louder and more intense this time. I knew it wasn't my dog, and this thing wanted in, and I knew I was in there. I can't remember how long this went on for. I cried myself to sleep that night. My Grandma's House As soon as my mom knew she was pregnant with a girl, my paternal grandmother was elated with her first grandgirl. She knitted caps for me, would cook meals for my mother, would boast to everybody about her incoming grandgirl. Sadly, she had terminal breast cancer, held on to see my birth in the first year of my life. During the year she was here after I was born, my parents would find her rocking me in an old wooden chair and sleeping with me, cooing and singing while turning the baby mobile and calm me. She quickly deteriorated, though. It was the day before Christmas, a year and a half since I'd been born. At the funeral, my parents went to clean out her house and sell and keep her belongings. There was nobody to watch me while cleaning out the house. I would be with them. They would put me in rolled rooms surrounded by blankets to keep me from falling off the edge. My mom and dad had both recounted times where they thought they would see shadows in the wooden chair rocking, call out my grandmother's name to have it suddenly stop. It would start giggling out of nowhere and my dad would run in to see the mobile moving. There was no draft in the air. I would also refuse to sleep in the baby bassinet that they brought to her house, it would fall asleep in seconds on the bed. After a while, these encounters stopped and eventually became a memory for them. But they've, well, they stated I picked up on many of her mannerisms, even without knowing her. Points of color I saw as a child. When I was a child, very young, I'm in my 40s now, I remember experiencing these small balls or beads of light. They would come in rows, maybe eight or ten. They would travel in a line up through my bedroom at night. They were like little trains of points of light that would travel one direction, go through a wall and come back another direction. Green, purple, blue, red, really all the colors of the rainbow. They were never frightening, and were actually comforting because I could expect them almost every night. 
They were not dancing or anything, literally just little points of light of varying colors, all in a straight line, like a train traveling in and out of the bedroom at different directions. They traveled without urgency and at a steady pace, crossing my bedroom of maybe 30 feet in 3 or 4 seconds. Did anyone else experience this, or remember something similar? I asked once at another site. A few other people also remembered a similar experience as a very, very young child. I would say it happened before I was five or six years old, give or take. I don't remember when it stopped, and I never really thought about it. And I suppose it just faded away. One day, a couple of years ago, just out of the blue, I happened to remember them. The lights were little pinpoints of each color, kind of muted, not too bright, but they would light up the bedroom or even cause reflections off the walls. Kind of like they were there and yet not there at the same time. I would say they were small, like less than an inch in diameter, maybe even less than half of an inch in diameter, all in a line spaced maybe two or three inches apart. And as I said, the line would just travel across my bedroom, in and out of the walls, heading various directions, changing colors. It was wild to think about as an adult now. I was never afraid, and I'm sure I was awake because it happened probably hundreds of times. My Parents Haunted House It all started when my parents redid their living room. They turned the entire side of the wall into mirrors from top to bottom. It was the late 80s, early 90s. People would walk into the mirrors thinking the room was just that big because it looked, well, had all these mirrors. I always felt like it was a portal to another side. As soon as it was done, it always gave me the creeps being in that room. I experienced everything, and this gives me chills just to write this stuff. But here we go. Hearing my name being called when I was alone. My foot being grabbed to wake up to nobody there. Blanket being pulled off. Always three scratch line marks on my body. Doorbell going off, nobody there. House alarm going off for no reason. My dad knocking on my room door at 1 a.m. or even later. It asked if it was me downstairs making noises. It wasn't. TVs would go on or off. Footsteps sounds like silverware dropping in the kitchen. And of course, going down to the kitchen and nothing being on the floor or the counter. Others could be in the house with me and experience stuff like my name being called clearly, sounding like my mom. They would be like your mom's calling you, and of course, say what, and she would just not call you, and your friend would be baffled. So this one night upstairs in my room alone, nobody's home. My bedroom door is open. You can see the top of the staircase leading up to the second floor where I was at. Loud footsteps start from the mirror room downstairs. You can feel them so heavy. They walk all the way to the beginning of the staircase, which is a good amount of steps because the mirror room was a little ways from the start of the steps. Of course, has my attention. I'm frozen in fear. I can hear a ringing sound in my ears. Everything was so still. They started coming up the steps. One step, then another, then another. I'm convinced somebody either broke into my house and I'm about to see them. Or it's something else that's crazy, because after the sixth or seventh step in that house, you'd have been able to see somebody coming up. Of course, I don't see anyone. Just hearing the steps until it gets to the top step. Then silence. Staring at my door. Cold sweat. Goosebumps all over. Hair standing up, and then all of a sudden, what I think looks like a younger version of my deceased grandfather just walks by. It's a younger, good-looking version of him. Not the older, sick version he was before he passed. He's wearing an outfit that's straight out of like 1960s New York City. Top hat matching suit. You hear maybe two or three more steps in the other room and then silence. I sat there for a couple of minutes making sure all sounds were gone. Caught my breath because it felt like I didn't breathe for minutes. Just so frozen. I got up, checked the next room of course, and it was empty. 
kind of just went back to doing what I was doing before, which was watching TV. That's how things were. Crazy shit would go down, have an experience, and just move on. After I moved out of that place, I haven't had any of those experiences again. And I'll never forget all the stuff. I can remember it like it happened yesterday. I think the house has been torn down and rebuilt into a mini mansion type place by the new people that live there. House I grew up in was haunted. 1. I was in middle school. Can't remember the exact year when this happened. Around 3 a.m. in the morning, my whole family was woken up to every single smoke detector in the house going off. We all ran around the house trying to find the fire. But there was none. And there was no sign of smoke anywhere. My dad regularly changes the batteries, so that couldn't have been it. We had a technician come the next day to see what happened, but even he couldn't find anything wrong with the smoke detectors. We never found out why they went off that day. 2. I was a freshman in high school when this happened. My mom and I were sitting in the family room watching TV when we heard a loud sound from upstairs. Her and I were the only two people in the house when this happened. It sounded like somebody jumped off the bed. The sound came from my room and onto the floor. My mom ran upstairs and I followed her. We found nothing upstairs and my mom calmly just walked back downstairs like nothing happened. She wasn't even phased. When I asked her if she remembered this happening a few years later, she said she didn't remember it, thought I was just making up a story. 3. This happened dozens of times from when I was in elementary school until I was a teenager. I had a cheap office chair in my room I would sit on. I had a desk with a laptop. Every now and then the chair would start violently shaking for two or three seconds. I would jump up and all the hairs in my body would stand straight up. It felt like my heart would stop. I would look around the room and see nothing around and be utterly confused. This also happened dozens of times from when I was younger until I was like a teenager. Sometimes when I was home alone and sitting on the couch, I would hear loud footsteps rushing down the steps. I would jump up and run to the steps and nothing would be there. 5. Whenever I hung out in the basement at nighttime, it felt like I was being watched. When I started hanging out with my friends in the basement when I was in high school, all my friends would report the same thing. We had an above-ground basement, and you could see the woods behind our house through the windows. Me and my friends would sometimes see shadows near the tree line. We always felt like we were being watched. The Shadow on the Corner I was home for the summer from college. It was around 2.30 in the morning when I was arriving at my house. I had been out at my friend's house catching up and playing video games. No drinking or drugging occurred because that might explain what I saw. So I live at a T intersection. There's no parking on my street. I didn't want to block in my mom because I was a lazy college student and wanted to sleep until noon. So I parked on the intersecting street as I had done many times before. It was dark just as you would expect 2.30 in the morning to be. The hot, thick air had settled for a brief period. It parked me down on the white Buick LeSabre in front of nosy Linda's house. Shut the door as quietly as I could to not disturb the silence of my neighborhood. Being a quiet neighbor is one of the most considerate things you can be. I put my keys in my pocket as I exited the car, even though I would need them to unlock the door 30 feet away from my present location. Again. I had not had a drop or a drink or a bowl to smoke when I saw this. Only cigarettes and water for the evening. I strolled to my front door anticipating a long sleep. I had taquitos for my breakfast. Or what you'd call lunch. That's when I spied it out of the corner of my eye. A black shadowy mass standing on the corner. I took a few more steps as the cold shudder filled my body cavity. Then I chuckled to myself. What the hell are you afraid of? Nothing's there. 
just turn around, I said in my head. The smirk on my face, I turned around and saw it clear and freshly cleaned window pane. The figure standing or hovering, if you like, was about six feet tall. There were no legs or arms, but more of a suggestion that it had once had appendages. Its color was dark black, as if it were standing into an endless swirling pool of a black hole. The only other color this being emitted was a gray face. It looked more like the static of an old tube television on the wrong channel. It didn't so much see me as it knew me. It could see everything I had done and everything I would do. I stared at it for what was mere seconds, but it seemed like a day. Then I regained what little faculty I had left and sprinted the final few feet to my door. The keys shook in my hand as I struggled to open both doors. As soon as I got inside, I looked out the peephole, hoping to glimpse that being again. But I could see nothing. I ran to my basement lair and covered my head with my old stinky comforter and shrivered myself to sleep. The next morning I saw nothing. I told no one until I tell you friends today. A couple of years later I inherited my childhood home after my mom passed away. It's been a decade and I still haven't seen the black shadow standing on the corner still look for it on most nights. A weird feeling saved my life. Am I overreacting? Something happened and I would like some input on the situation. A few weeks ago I was leaving work. I had the feeling of having to throw up. I didn't think much of it because I had just eaten a whole pizza for lunch. Damn. As I left the building heading to my car, I got extremely hot, like full-on sweating and feeling like I was getting a fever. My mouth started to feel weird, and I started to taste something irony. As soon as I touched the door handle of my car, the feeling changed into freezing. I sat in my car shivering and started the motor. I pulled to the exit of the car park, waited for the car to pass. A few did. A little further away came another car. I could have driven easily, but for some reason I couldn't take my foot off the clutch. My whole body refused. I couldn't move because of that uneasy feeling, so I let it pass. I finally drove up behind him. A few hundred meters further on, a speeding caddy took the right away. Luckily, he only clipped the car before me. The car driving ahead of me was a little too fast, he could say. It was a pretty big one. There were gladly no injuries. If I'd pulled up before him, would have been the one getting hit. And my car's a little older, small, almost no yielding zone, which means I would have been severely injured or dead if a bigger car hit me with the speed and angle. As a witness, I of course stopped, asked if everything was okay and left my contact. I got back into my car and drove off. After the scene was out of my eyesight, I was still feeling a little uneasy for much better reason. I'm not superstitious or anything, but could it be that I died in another reality? I'm 100% sure the iron taste I had in my mouth was my own blood. The heat was my car being hit, maybe burning, and the cold was my own death, all in an alternate universe. I just want to get it off my chest. When I was about nine to ten years old, my mom sent me to the store to buy something. The store is a straight five minute walk from my home. On the way there I saw my father's best friend, but he looked kind of odd. He didn't smile like usual and he didn't reply or look at me when I told him hi. He just walked straight looking in front of him. But his eyes looked so odd, like empty. I mean, like he didn't look at anything in particular, just front. He walked in the direction of his house. But I didn't watch him. Well, to see if he reached in. We lived next to each other. I thought he had just had a bad day. So I continued to the store without looking back at him. And then I went home. When I came home, I told my dad about it. I remember it clearly as our conversation went exactly like this. Hi, Dad. Mr., insert my friend's name, looked really sad today. 
He didn't say hi to me. My dad. What are you talking about? He died yesterday. And that was it. I got so scared I run to the bathroom and locked myself in for some time. My father was trying to comfort me after, but I don't remember what happened after that or how I felt. Of course, many people didn't believe me. Most of them said that I just saw someone similar. But to make it clear, I was born in a small town in Poland, and his friend was an Arabic man. He didn't look anything like anyone else there, and it was impossible to mistake him with anyone because of his curly black hair and darker skin. So I'm 100% sure who I saw at that time, and it was him. I just don't know how or why did I see him. I'd learned after a few years that he actually committed suicide the day before I saw him. His daughters found him dead in his bed. Why do you think I saw it? Did I actually see a ghost? If I knew he was dead, I'd think it was just my imagination. But why would I have imagined him when I thought he was well and alive? Well, I'm glad you're all well and alive. For now. Sweet dreams. See ya.